Uh, so now we're back, I think. Um, we've hashed out these ideas about what we need for matrices. Now I tried to make the solution in advance. So this is just a suggested solution. This was more inventive and had any more operations. So yes, matrix element type defined operations and matrix multiply and put that one first as the ma matrix operation and then only plus star on elements. So we quite good. Ah, hmm? uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, it, yes, it becomes slightly difficult to parse. Matrix addition, it does the plus of the elements, the matrix subtraction, bullet point, minus symbol on the element. <laughs> zero matrix, zero on the elements, identity matrix, zero and one on the elements. So, yes, we're good. I didn't include transpose, but we call it matrix division even though I might break a mathematician's heart with that. Are you a mathematician by training? I'm a mathematician, just... Okay. But I'm married to pure muscle. <laughs> 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 you make it with your mathematics. Same thing. <laughs> <laughs> but then you love some things coming later on, I think. <laughs> so matrix division, if I'm just doing like Gaussian solver, mm -hmm. plus, minus, star, and slash. If I want to do pivoting, I also need a max function. So I can choose the best pivot. That's the, that's why I do pivoting, isn't it? So this is sort of roughly, it might not be fully accurate, but this is sort of musing on standard ideas of what an algorithm does. These are the things I need. Yeah, in a certain way, it's, it's about the principle. Yes. So it, it was, it's quite an instructive example. What, what I need to think about. And if, if here on the board we miss one or two, it doesn't matter. You were in the thought process, which was the important thing with the exercise of the board. And as you can see, I missed some operations, but I think the thought process here is the most important thing. So then how do we organize these requirements? And then there's standard mathem mathematical jargon for these. We've got semi-group, which is a binary function, let's call it combine. And examples of this are plus, multiplication, minimum, and maximum. Order, existing order. This means no, no, max no, no. you need an order. No, no, no. This is a binary operation min. This is a binary operation max. But in mathematics, that uh, what you need that in order to have a min and max, you need an order. Now, if I say what is larger than the other. If I have a binary function and min and max, then I have an ordered semi-group. But if I say my binary operation is min, it's still just a semi-group. Okay, let's go. My binary operation is the max function. That's a binary function, it's associative, so that's my semi-group, it's a max function semi-group. Which is different from an ordered semi-group, which is both a plus operation and the max operation. So it's not a semi-group, it's something more. Monoid, binary function, which basically is the semi-group, plus a constant function. So let's call them combine and empty, like from lists. We combine two lists, concatenate two lists, and we have empty lists as needed to them. Semi-ring, we have binary plus, binary multiply, we have two constants, zero, which is supposed to be monoid, one is supposed to be monoid, we just do utility requirements, yeah, I mean, annihilation requirements, but we're not doing requirements, we're just doing syntax. These are neutral elements. Yes? The, um, the key of zero is that it's a neutral element for the class, and for the one is neutral. Yes, yes. And we want these to distribute, and we want this to be a zero, so it emulates multiplication and lots of technical stuff. But syntactically, we just need these four for a summary ring. A unit ring is everything in a summary ring plus the negation function or subtraction function. And then we have a field where we have the division or inverse to sort of complete the operations of the unit ring. So this is sort of one way of organizing lots of these requirements, which we sort of listed when we tried to figure out what do we need for the matrix. And if you look at the matrix requirements again, we can sort of see that, okay, we need 
these two, we need this, we need this, so it sort of all floats around sort of these standard mathematical concepts. Now let's think about instantiations because we templated it. So now we can sort of throw in the yield, for instance. Then we can do uh, first time minus zero one slash or max, and we get all the matrix operations back. And mil plus minus zero one, the Gaussian solver and the solver with pivot. If we throw in complex, we can get operation plus star minus zero one and slash, but we don't have the max operation. So we can get everything, but we cannot get the Gaussian solver. It's not supposed to be there. Because we don't have the max functions so and we can't do pivoting. So this I need to erase this from my slide. Um, if we throw an integer, well. You have the max, but you don't have the slash, so you lose both solvers. Now we can do something very interesting, something called the tropical submarine. For in type real, it has operations min, in which position? I'm using min now, but which position in this list of arguments is min placed? Remember the list of arguments is like this. So the minimum function comes in place of plus. The plus function comes in the place of the multiplication operation. Now I don't have an inverse, but I have infinity for zero, and I have zero for one. This is my instantiation. These operations form a summary. For the minimum function, infinity is the neutral element. For the plus function, zero is the unit element. And they distribute over each other as they should. And uh, inf is an infinite length, therefore plus, because infinity plus something is infinity. And this is called the tropical submarine because it was studied by a Brazilian mathematician. And I get matrix operations, matrix multiplied, because that only requires star and plus. I get matrix addition because that only requires plus. I get the zero matrix because I have the infinity, and I get the unit matrix because I have infinity and zero. So is this useful beyond being sort of a fun example? It's actually being used for graph algorithms. And there's a project called Graph Plus that has lots of industrial support. And they're trying to define standard building blocks for graph algorithms in the language of linear algebra. So basically using the matrix language we talked about. Uh, they want to sort of say it's not a research project anymore, but it's sort of the need we need to build this standard set of primitive building blocks. We are building a uh, powerful sparse matrix library because the graphs they're looking at, sort of Google, Nvidia, Facebook, are very large sparse graphs which turn into very large sparse matrices. And it's called graph blast because it's all the basic linear algebra system for graphs. And uh, if it's okay, let's put in a short video, a couple of minutes, given by Tim Davis from Texas. He's one of the sort of players in this setting. Let's see, how do I get hold of this? Oh, I need to go out of this thing. I actually don't know what I'm exposing. Oh, not too bad.
How do I copy this? Open hyperlink, copy hyperlink location. And then I go back to this window. Yes, I don't know why they add it. I think this is much weird, trying to create. I thought I'd, ah, we have to switch off. GraphPlus already appears in several commercial products, and it has a large and growing community, including NVIDIA, Intel, Redis Labs, IBM, MIT Lincoln Lab, and many others. High-level packages, such as MATLAB and the BLAS, have transformed high-performance matrix computations. The GraphPlus vision is to create a groundbreaking transformative shift in how graph algorithms are expressed as linear algebraic operations over submarines applied to sparse adjacency matrices, giving us a powerful high-level abstraction in which we can easily write complicated graph algorithms while at the same time achieving a high level of performance. I think we're back now. Can you speak? I think we're back to normal. Yeah, we're, back. we're back to normal, yeah. But I can't find the. Uh, uh. You can control the microphones by touching. Yes, the, it's uh, white. The the stuff that you control over there, that is the speakers that I have uh, on the wall. Yeah. Uh.
Fascinating. So um, this was just motivational saying that doing this kind of instantiation of a matrix is useful in certain domains. And graph class is built around the idea of the semi ring. So we use various instantiations to achieve graph algorithms implemented as linear algebra. I think this is interesting, but it also shows that we should not make a simpler generic system than the one you're trying to decide, because if you just assume that these operations are the normal operations from the environment, in this case sort of type integer operations, we are not getting the ability to instantiate the tropical matrix or the tropical semi-ring which prevents us from accessing these graph algorithms using the templated matrix. Yes? Um, silly question. So, um, you have, uh, so your examples are not properly ordered. But um, if I, so you have uh, perhaps the most complex one or the yes, most yes. feature full one upstairs where you have here and you have a maximum. Yep. If you have uh, then just go down, one line, you, we don't have a maximum, therefore we can't have a solver with the PV. Yes. So quite often in mathematics, you sort of build it up from the bottom. Um, so um, if you have a semi-ring, we can implement a template library with, which does a sort of at the bottom. Mm -hmm. We have a, a matrix multiplication, we have a matrix addition, and we have the, uh, the zero and the one matrix. Mm -hmm. Then if we add features, uh, then we can have more uh, matrix operations. Yes. Yes. So uh, that is a, it's, a, it's a bit like what Jonas had this morning. He started off with a shape, and then uh, when he declared the shape is now a square, he added some feature, and um, so it's this built-up system. And, uh, yes, yes. So the idea is that uh, we need this kind of flexibility. We cannot assume that we always have all operations. So if we drop some of these operations, obviously we lose some of these algorithms. So if you want to build up our matrix template library, we need to be conscious of this and not assume that we always have everything. And we need to see sort of, okay, maybe we're saying that the matrix multiply is basis, so we always assume a semi-ring, we always assume at least certain basics as being present. And then we see that if I want certain other algorithms, I need to require certain additional properties. So we need to be able to say the matrix template has these parameters, but uh, for this function, I need these additional parameters. For this function, I need these additional parameters. And we get a sort of very complicated structure of which operations are needed where, but basically it sort of says this is the basic matrix and these are the requirements for the various operations we want to have on matrices. The more you have, the more powerful matrix library you get. The fewer operations you have, well, you're limited to what you can instantiate. So this has been a this driving force for the instantiation, observing this kind of patterns. We needed to have a varying length number of parameters dependent on the requirements of the individual operations. And yes, sort of, this is sort of the minimal that we need to get started. And then the other things are sort of extensions. But you can always sort of imagine that maybe you can do without the zero and one. So you have a more general instantiation of matrix operations. So it's sort of what can we do away with and what operations can we get back so this is mostly motivational, saying that, okay, we need this flexibility so that we can do these things. And I'm starting here because this is what everyone expects. Uh, in C++, you can easily do these variations. This was something that wasn't there in the 1990s, but came in 2003, that we could have a class templated class, and inside a templated class, you could have functions with extra template arguments, which is needed for the same uh, 
These are sort of the basic operations that I will assume, the summary operations, and then we need extra operations for solvers, we need extra operations for solvers and pivots, we need extra operations for this. We need to have that flexibility in our generic system. And many people just sort of say, can't you simplify it? I'm not thinking about these flexibilities. If you're just used to this, then something, then sort of connecting to context becomes possible. But if you want to have this one, you really cannot just assume what's available around. You need to control the naming of every operation. You need to instantiate things in non-standard ways. But some of these things uh, seem to be to me, uh, what is my intention? So if I just want to develop an application which only needs the top one, mm -hmm. then I can, uh, I can be quite cheap. Um, just implement the top one and be done with. If I want to prov uh, provide a general uh, matrix library to the scientific community, which everyone then can just uh, link to, connect to, then you might need to have the free data. Mm -hmm. Yes? I agree. And the thing is that the developer of the library chooses for flexibility. But it's important for us that when we design the feature that we're not limiting you to the top line. So that's why we feel very motivated by these examples. But you don't need to make such a flexible matrix library because you don't have a very specific use in mind. And you may have specific choices for that use case to allow you to do certain conversations that otherwise wouldn't be possible. But we're not forcing you to do it one way or the other, we're giving you the flexibility and the type safety of whatever your choice is. The compiler will do its normal type checking of your template program. But also, matrices, feedback, multiplication, addition, subtraction, zero, one, and solvers. So I can create a block matrix by using the matrix multiply as my multiply, matrix addition as my addition, and I sort of build up a block matrix just by instantiating the matrix once more on the already constructed matrix. And this is very powerful. And needed as well, great. Mm -hmm. Now, sort of taking a step back into theory is sort of generic programming is maximizing the use. But we can sort of see a generic program as a factor from the required API, whatever you list as your premises, to a provided API. So you have this sort of functionability. It's like a function from APIs to APIs. Um, these are sort of syntactic requirements to compile the code, type check, and everything. And the provided API gives you new syntax which you use when we benefit from and you use instantiation. But if you think about sort of, ah, so they can make block matrices. We are talking about, I can create, let's say, rings from rings. So rings are an essential mathematical concept, and numbers are rings. Linear algebra, scalars are rings, vectors are rings, matrices are rings, sort of more abstract tensors are rings. So all these ring structures, and all of them depend on the template arguments to be rings. Okay, so we can mix, put in any one we like, and we can get linear algebra on top of them, and we can then reuse that ring we created in building the block matrix, etc. In coordinate free numerics, we have something called ring fields, which is sort of a large data structure corresponding to, uh, let's say, data sets, the temperature in the room over the entire room, normal discretization. But this is a ring. Tensor fields are rings, sort of how things move around, how they change. 
And these are rings, we can feed them in here. We can feed these rings as elements of these rings. And you can very quickly build extreme complicated data structures just by composing these ring templates inside each other, building up new things. Maybe other construction of fractions. So you can throw in the thing and make fractions out of any of the other rings. Complex numbers. If it's not complex numbers with a real and imaginary component, it can be complex numbers out of matrices. The mathematics works because the rings are the requirement for building these things. For the Cayley Dixon construction, which creates complex numbers from reals and creates the octarians, the sextonians, etc., etc., based on the same construction of complex numbers. But they sort of lose the ring concepts after a few iterations. But the construction works are infinitum. Uh, the constructions of lattices from lattices, lattices are like minimum maximum operations, set union, set intersection, which are closely related to partial orders. Lattices are somewhat better structured partial orders. But then you can construct lattices from lattices. So in the old days, we used to have dictionaries and lexica. Those were built from a lattice from a lattice. So your individual characters have an ordering. And then you put the characters into strings, and you order the strings based on the ordering of the characters. This is called lexical ordering, and was a big invention in the 17th century, I think, when they started writing these dictionaries and lexicon because you needed to have a systematic way of finding what you were looking for. So constructing lattices from lattices of partial orders from partial orders is the thing we've been doing. Now we've got a mathematical framework or template port programming framework where you can do this thing. If you have something which is a lattice, like reels with maximum and minimum, you can use that to order lists of reels and build further structures on top of that. And we've been working with something called data dependency algebras, which can be used to investigate uh, dependency properties of algorithms. And then we have constructors saying, well, if I have a certain dependency, if I have a dependency, I can build new dependencies based from that. And in a few iterations, we can really build up very complex dependencies without doing any more work than just putting things together. Now, this kind of pumping of abstractions isn't the thing we've seen too far, so much in uh, building a software using templates. Because you can't really do that without having type safe templates where you're forced to make everything explicit because then you can feed in your things and build more complicated stuff. So I think that once we have something like type safe generics, we can start thinking about this way of building complicated data. And I think this will dramatically cut down on the way we are and how much code we have to write, because we are mostly combining templates, instantiations, than writing code from scratch. And that's of several benefits. One is the type safety. The other is that when we reuse the same thing, we typically get uh, more sort of field testing of it and we improve the quality. And this kind of reuse allows more people to access the same information access the same code and use it for more specific purposes. So I think this is something that we will be able to see once we get started on this kind of uh, programming support that we get from TypeSafe generics. So this is why I'm saying this is the future of HPC because it allows us to build stuff in new ways, more flexible ways than we have seen hitherto. The specific subpart of this is that the requirements that are rather lengthy and verbose, we can reuse them. 
So I mentioned sort of semi-group, monoid, semi-ring, unit ring field. Oh, there's lots of other things like lattices. And we have other things in vector like, 14 and 26, Chicago 3, sinus, cosinus, tangent, onwards and onwards. Maybe we make a package out of those. Uh, exponential issue, exponent, exponent by 10 by 2, by reasons by 10 by 2, all kinds of arbitrary power functions. Well, photon has a notation for it, but we have, can make it available, we can use it in constructions. Hyperbolics, we can have a package for that, and if you need them in your computation, you just import this package into your setting and use it. Also, an interesting thing with combining this stuff is that you may have the same type in all of these. So in submarine with these operations, you may combine things in other ways. And you won't get into trouble. The mathematics of combining requirements is sorted out. It's well understood and it's nice. It's taking the union of all the declarations. And it works, it works for the instantiations. So this is theory going back to the early 70s, the early 80s, and being studied for a long time and being used in many sort of specification systems. Yes? Can I just ask back whether I'm understanding or not? So you have, for instance, your trigonometric functions. Yes. Um, so standard in Fortran, I just find sign of a real number, it's yes. its also design. So this is an intrinsic function. So most of these things are. So I is proposing to drop the intrinsic and move no. it into template elements. No, I'm saying if you're writing template code, and in the template body you want to have trigonometry, you need to have access to those functions on your type T. Your type T can be real or it can be complex. So then you say, I want, the, I'm writing now a template. In this template, I want to have field operations and trigonometry operations. So I take the union of the operations for field with these operations. And that's the vocabulary I can use inside the template body. I cannot use other things because T can be anything. If I want to use hyperbolics, I have to include them. So physicists use exponentials of matrices. I'm not yes. out of the box, I'm not sure about logarithms, but exponentials out of matrices so that T would be a matrix body is totally common. Mm -hmm. So if you have an implementation, that's another thing, because now we're talking about this is the requirement level. What you're saying is in my matrix library, I want to have an exp function. So what, what I was trying to tell you is that uh, with the XR, that if you have a subclass of X, that just the exponentials, then your T could actually, uh, you just say it is complex and real numbers, so your T could actually be matrices like SU1s, SU2, SU2s, SU3s, and so on. And then you want a fire splitting of this XR into some operations which are meaningful matrices, some operations which are not meaningful. And yes, write such a requirement, even copy paste this one, delete the ones you don't like, and keep the rest. Copy, edit, save is sort of one way of creating requirements. But it's sort of easier if you can just hold and use something. Here we have experience that we really need to be careful about how much things we require. So there's lots of mathematical, basically for each one of these, there's a mathematical theory at least. And there are other combinations, operations, which have names and at least one thesis studying them. So we sort of need to get very complicated structures before nobody has started that yet. Also, this is sort of an example of a requirement you can have if you want a full blown setting. Or you can sort of say, well, this was a good first guess, but I'll get me the half of the functions in the requirements for this computation. Just a very good observation. It's exactly the same flexibility that we're looking for here. Saying I don't need all of them, I cannot require all of them, I just need a few. 
but I don't think we should make sort of one requirement for each one of these. I don't think I'll bundle them together, and when you don't need them, you just make your special version of this with the ones you need. And sort of these are general, these sort of mirror the photon intrinsics, these mirror certain mathematical concepts, and we have sort of the channel ops, which was very specific for the sort of that computational algorithm. Uh, here's a different problem, the moving platform problem. So instead of sort of trying to average the speed between Bergen and Umeo, I'm now on this slow moving train, I'm on this sort of open platform on a slow moving train, and this is part of a computer game. So over that wall, there's something I need to jump over. So let's assume there wasn't a wall there, just this lower part here. So the platform will slide underneath here. And if I'm not jumping at the right moment, I will get this contraction and not follow further on. So the thing is, I can run this way. And then I'll have to take a longer time before I hit the barrier. I can run this way and I will hit the barrier soon. But maybe with that position, that jump. So that set of requirements, the requirements for this problem is different from the traveling problem. In this sentence, I need distance, I need time, I need speed. Uh, so I'm using the semi group on speed. Because now I can add my relative motion on the platform with a platform's motion with the step to the ground to figure out my speed of motion with respect to the barrier that I need to jump over or avoid in that way. And then I need a special division operation which says take a distance from here to the barrier, take the speed I'm moving with, and compute how many seconds I have before I crash into the barrier. That is, I can use that to compute when do I need to jump, so how many seconds from that. So this is the division operation. And then I have my travel template, where I add together my relative speed with the plat moving platform. And then I divide the distance from where I am now to the barrier to figure out how many seconds I have before I need to jump. So this is a different problem. It involves the same things, but it has different algebra, it has different operations to work with. And it allows me to write different solutions. And these things are not cast in stone. I come up with them as I need them. And here I don't need to write the large explicit declaration because I can reuse something that I assume is in the library because semi group is something that is is around and very often used. Uh, so this was travel. And I'll shorten this one. So we have semi group on D and semi group on T. And then I'll E divided by T to give me the speed. So this is sort of summarized the travel versus the moving platform. So this says that we can build our own requirements dependent on the problem we want to solve. We can pull in lots of stuff from different places, or we can target very specifically the domain we're working. And these are some sort of things to think about when you want to target a specific domain. So in physics, it's dimensional safety, like time, distance, and speed. But do you want to separate length, width, and height, which is sort of very useful when you're trying to put furniture into a room at the planning stage? And then you want to rotate things, so then you've got transformations between the different two axes. That's a choice. Think about it. You can distinguish these things, or you can integrate them into length, 
the same machine. Uh, often we mix intuitive new concepts because we measure them in the same way. Like length and height, it's both meters are they the same or are they different? But sort of a very misconception is time versus duration. So how many nanoseconds is it since the 1st of January 1970? That's time on the computers. Or are we talking about the time duration since I started up till now or up till we finished for today? Duration and time are two different things. So if you're going to make this sort of useful, we need to separate them. Especially we see this with temperature and temperature difference. Temperature is an absolute zero, and it goes upwards. Temperature differences can be negative. This is colder than that, this is warmer than this. You can multiply temperature differences saying this is 10 times temperature difference from over there. You cannot really multiply temperatures because they are related to the absolute temperature. So we need to keep those two things separate. We can do that by defining our own requirements with these two things as different concepts. And the ability to apply a temperature difference to a temperature to get a new temperature. We just need to be careful with how we define the requirements. We've got a position, well, if it's just an x-axis like the train line versus the distance things are moving. The position on the train line is different from something moving a certain distance along that train line. Energy versus torque are two very different physical concepts, but they have the same measurements, same units. So we should be very careful in how we set up our requirements so that we are talking about the right physical things in our formulas. And then sort of we can make our types arbitrary fine-grained, setting up our restrictions. We can separate angles which we fit into the sine function and ratios which comes out of the sine function. And the arc sine function takes in the ratio and returns an angle. Uh, we can even choose to separate scales. So maybe we have one type for giga electron world and another for mega electron world. So this is a problem at CERN where the old accelerator software was in mega electron worlds. The new Alex sound accelerator software is in giga electron worlds. What calls the teams from the MEV library? Do you need to be conscious about when I'm calling something in MEV and multiply this by a thousand? And when I'm calling something, getting the result, I'm going to divide it by a thousand to get it into the modern system. So by introducing two different types, which both are real numbers when I instantiate it, I'm keeping my code type safe and doing the right thing when it comes to uh, using these two different factors. And we can even think about ejections. So exponentials takes us from reals to positive reals. And logs take us from positive reals to reals. Other functions can be seen as taking us between different domains. Uh, for instance, are we in the frequency domain or in the amplitude domain? And there are transformations between these two domains. Maybe we should keep those as different types in our template body so that we don't confuse them by mishap. The values belong to different types. They can only interact in certain ways. And this is very common. Where we have things that work on one type and things that work on another type. And these two types are closely related. Statistics commutative distribution functions and probability density functions. Some computations works on the PDF format, some computations works on the CDF format, 
by having these two types, you have a clear distinction of what operations works in which format, and then you can translate between these two representations, derivation and integration moves you back and forth. So it's sort of things to think about, but you don't have to make all these derived types. You just think about what is useful in my template body. And you may know that all of these are going to be real values, all of these are going to be additions and multiplications, but you can keep them separate in your template body. And you get this extra type security to detect problems in your code. So I think this is a very powerful motivation for keeping template bodies type safe and having all the declarations being explicit. These are my requirements. Add another function if you need it, and you will discover that as you try to write code, but then you're conscious about it that I need something that I didn't think about initially. And it doesn't harm anything by adding more stuff. Maybe you add more stuff on a per-function basis, maybe you add it for your entire template. This is a design decision, but at least it's things to think about, possibilities that are good. And you don't get this from C++ templates because you don't have the type safety of the body. And the instantiation would be flowed anyway, so you won't discover things in your instantiation either. So this is something you get with TypeSafe Fortran, TypeSafe templates. I think you have it in Ada, but Ada isn't your typical HPC language. Now, how are you for time? Yes, uh, 15.30. So we're supposed to continue for you can continue about the two hours if you want to. Yeah, but looking at the audience, they seem to be getting towards their limit. It, it, it depends. So one of my problems is, is that the sunset here is something like two hours earlier than it is in the room. So yeah, I, it feels to me like it is seven. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not starting what inside. Yeah, I think it's not starting what inside. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, I was thinking, I was thinking about overheads. So if I just take these things, uh, so quite often, it depends how big your. Um, so some of the things you are showing seem to me like a like a big gun, and uh, so you um, setting all this up that was commented on earlier. It's very verbose, and you need to type, 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 type. type. And uh, if, if I just want to do a quick code to do something, this is most likely the, the relation of overhead to coding. Is, uh, yes, you're not, not talking about computation overhead, you're talking about the typing overhead. Uh, yeah, if this, so if, if I just run, want, to, want to run a small application uh, or essentially a small program calculating a few things on the quick on the side, then all this, uh, or if I just take your uh, this example you started off with the first, um, yes. you know, this example here, exactly, uh, sort of this. Um, but notice that in the beginning we had large declaration here and the large declaration here. Now we say we don't need those declarations because we are reusing the semi-group requirement. Yeah, if somebody has done something. Yeah, on yes, the so other hand, if I, if I think about your original example, if I just had to write that in Fortran, yeah. without any of these, no templates, whatever, I just want to implement it in real, how, how fast was my average speed from, uh, mm -hmm. from Bergen to uh, Umeo, then uh, you haven't even flushed your slides, then I almost have written the code. It's, it's just that I have to take care of these mistakes which you pointed out, but if it's such a small application, it yes. might be better that I just concentrate for five minutes and be done with. And yes. uh, sort of not to con and confuse MEV and TEV like you just pointed out. But if it's, so there is somewhere is there, there is a middle ground. Once the whole thing gets bigger, then these things pay off. Yes. And this is what I always had a problem with when I'm teaching people OO or how to organize code is that you're shooting sparrows with cannons. 
what we can fit inside a lecture is basically not solved with the technology I'm trying to teach you. Because I'm trying to teach you how to maneuver a cannon, but the examples you're working on are like sparrows. That's the only thing that will fit on the slide. Yeah, yeah. But if you can see sort of there's a motivation when you go to bigger problems, there's motivation when you're worried about things, then you have a motivation for starting to use these things when they are appropriate. And that's sort of much of the point. They're not supposed to solve every problem, <coughs> even though I think sort of I make all these mistakes, so the extra type safety helps me. But other people are much better at looking at code and seeing the problems like this plus we had in the C++ template, which wasn't allowed in the Fortran template, the plus operate the plus symbol. So as long as you have large application libraries, for example, this could be a feature to make it more robust and easier to use, perhaps as well. Yes. Uh, so that that's probably the target audience, not not uh, creating quick things directly. It's, yep. So this is sort of you have the larger toolbox and you want to use it wisely. So I'm not saying you should use this for the travel example. I'm saying. I can show the idea with a travel example. But I make the nested block matrix solver. That probably isn't an efficient solver algorithm for block matrices. But I can at least, in that setting, quickly come up with it because I can reuse an existing template. But it's not necessarily a good way of solving that problem once you want speed. But it's a fast way of building a prototype. So it's sort of, yes, you're quite right. Writing the code for this is much shorter than getting all this machinery in place. But for these basic mathematical concepts, I assume that there will be a library where you just grab them. Of course, if you have a mathematical training, this will be much easier than if you come from a physics background, you typically don't talk about semi-groups that much. Yes, you need typically you need to instantiate G with some domain specific type. It's not always the reals that is the solution. Uh, we disallowed the use of type bound procedures inside the template body. So you would have to wrap them as standalone functions. So so found that that's, it's the percent notation in Fortran or the dot notation in C++. When we sort of say object dot function instead of saying function parenthesis argument. Why do you disallow that? Uh, because then you would have to decide when I write the template, is this template for object types or is it for intrinsic types? Okay. Yep. So by saying it's always the function notation, that's something that we can use for all your types. Um, but then it's sort of some people get annoyed because they cannot use the percent, but it takes them a little bit more than two lines to wrap it as a normal function call. But then I will need to do the line or something like that uh, in uh, coming from a performance point of view, I always get nervous if you have functions which uh, Right. Yes. No, but you probably also want to inline the body of the presented function to get access to the data fields directly. Now in C, they've put in the standard the compilers shall inline away the overhead of this function call. Uh, Fortran doesn't have that tradition as far as I know. But yes, you should write to your compiler vendor and complain about it. Can that, um, if that ever turns Fortran standards, what you show here, mm -hmm. can, can one uh, mandate that or strongly recommend it to the compiler vendors that uh, in order to get performance in line? I don't think it will be in the standard because that's not the Fortran way. But I think when people talk about it and they say, 
compiler A and C does inline this, so there's no overhead, while compiler B doesn't inline it, so you can really see the term difference. Then maybe that will also push compiler as the B to improve their code. But that's called quality of implementation, and it's sort of not in the standard. We might try to put it in there, but we probably get pushback from the rest of the committee on trying to do that. But at least it would then be in the preparatory papers so people can pick it up and write their compiler vendors and complain. And most vendors are sensitive to the users wanting something. So compiler vendors, because in GCC, for example, for the yep. project, how do they set their requirements for what goes into their compiler? Is that a committee decision inside of GCC? Uh, let's see. Um, G Fortran has some people on the committee, and they are very eager to get things into the compiler. But there's also a feeling that the way G Fortran is structured and basically the GCC project is structured is that doing certain things are very difficult because the code base is convoluted. Mm. L Fortran has a very nice internal structure, so that's why they can do these sort of early prototyping. And the other compiler vendor sees this as a more heavy duty thing and they will sort of delay it until it's in the standard because then they want to say we are 2028 compatible and therefore they want to put it in there. But then they are known that if users come and sort of say uh, we want this, they will respond by doing it. So I complained to Nag at the time I was just an ordinary user and said that I can't use the cover notation. And then I responded, well, we don't support cover A's, so that's natural. And I said, that's fine, but let me at least have one cover A image so that I can reuse my code, which I've written for some other compiler, also with a Nag compiler. And after a few months, it was there. So they're still not running parallel, but I can at least take the code and throw it at their compiler and it will pass. So I think they are quite open sort of to sort of not just yeah, use the demand with the reason for why we want certain things. So if you sort of start thinking about this, you want it. L4 Chan is not really a production compiler yet, but they are very sensitive to becoming that. So they're thinking that sort of being early supporters of generics might give them an edge because then they will be alone in the market for some time before the others get there. On the other hand, if I write an application, if I then get into grief and so on. Typically, use my users, I recommend them don't use any features which are not in the compiler standard for at least three minutes, if you want portable code. Yeah. Um, well, many of the active compilers are still not complete 2018. They're sort of mostly 2018, almost complete 2008, and complete 2003 for transfer. Things are getting slowly. <laughs> But part of the reasons is that many of the compilers deal with legacy code and the legacy users are not using the new features, so there's no demand for the new feature. So your users might not demand it, but you can sort of demand it from the compilers on your machines that might have an effect. I'm using l and I can use this type safe generics. Why don't you support it? Yeah, on the other. Okay, we get to one second. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, get him. Yes, yes. yes. Uh, uh, it's just a comment. Uh, 
someone saying the current NAG compiler supports co arrays with thread parallel execution. Okay, good. They have to the parallel instance. But this was a few years ago, and that was the situation that I mentioned. So we have some more in the audience who likes the NAG compiler. <laughs> yeah, well, that's great because it's an independent compiler system and it's not tied to any particular computer, so it's good to have those things in there. And if they actually do proper cover race now, it's sort of even better. We're using one compiler, the app sort is, is continuing the uh, compiler's uh, app sort. Yeah, there's a, yeah, it's well known in Windows. I think it's a, a Windows. They, they have a large, have a large market at some point, and then I just saw a note that they're actually executing. Uh huh. Yeah. No, so even in the open standards, they just talk about some of the compilers executing in dead, but there's sort of lots of new compiling projects that's showing up. And then there's flying, there's L4 Chan. I think even there are sort of two versions of Flang, it's sort of classical Flang and modern Flang version. So it's sort of, even though some compilers have become stale and some compilers disappear, it sort of seems to be an activity in the market. On Wikipedia it says the cease operation on 30th of September. This year? Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. So it seems they just went. And they had a good reputation for uh, and I think uh, it was a small company that they couldn't probably sustain it. And it was one of the competition as well. Yes, um, none of the big vendors they tried them. Because the Fortran group was bought by Nvidia, I think, yeah. so their private people are now working for Nvidia. It yeah. could be that they still sell it some, to somebody, I don't know. But I have a user which code compiles only with PGI. Mm -hmm. And when we lost the license for PGI, he complained bitterly and we uh, put the NVIDIA thing on and it compiles again. He cannot compile this Intel, he cannot compile this GCC, and I'm very worried what kind of issues he has in the code because typically it's something like an overrun array or whatever. Ouch. <laughs> yeah. These type of things, if codes break under optimization, you increase, decrease the optimization flag, it's a strong thing that uh, you have a problem in that department. Mm -hmm. But I would have thought that Microsoft would have gotten a good for the compiling for Windows. Yeah, I was, but they, they were at some point. Uh, they sold it to, I think it was Digital. Uh -huh. And then it sold, sold to Compact. And now I think it's back in Intel. So the original Microsoft compiler has made that kind of travel. So you can still use, I, I developed some application code on Windows, and you can still use the Microsoft directive uh -huh. with the interpretation of program compiler. Okay. So that is, that, that is a Microsoft contribution. I should it's, it, it's, it's Intel, so. Yes. Yeah. 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 Microsoft is one of the big customers. Can I just uh, try to get things on track? You asked earlier how much time do you have? Do you have uh, so I was wondering if uh, we are sort of really convened about an hour ago, and then we made another 15 minutes break, and then uh, yeah. you then would like to talk in an hour more or something like that. I have more material today, but I can't recall how much I have because I've been editing and reorganizing stuff. So it, it, it's a bit up to you, but I was, I'm not sure how the others feel. I was wondering. Uh, also based on how I feel and what my students comment if I teach, they complain if I teach one and a half hours in a row. They want a yes, I can just see that I have another exercise coming up, so let's take a break. Yeah, we'll yeah. take a break, yes. Okay. So, so we'll sort of get thinking about this exercise and then we we'll take a break. So, so uh, I propose we record with 16 or 5. It's now 10 to 4. Yeah, and I'll see if we look at the exercise. Uh, the well, I'll just go through the exercise yeah, okay. So, um, very simple, kinetic energy, from the need speed, mass, energy, and momentum. If you're going to use multiplication operations, when you start writing it out, you'll see. 
a similar exercise for potential energy. Again, very simple dimensions involved. And then you want to write some code which tells you how to convert between kinetic and potential energy. So you can have this ball sort of going up and down. Oh, no, modern, a skater going up and down this half pipe. You can have, uh, how is it called in German, Fieberschlag. So you have a pendulum with a stick. This is also a very interesting object. It can rotate round. Yes, if you push it hard enough. Or your child on the swing, you sort of yeah, have push it. Yeah, you have the problem because it's a chain or a rope. It stops at a certain point, but if it's a stick... Yes, the interesting thing is if you get it around, it goes faster and faster. Yeah. I like to set, uh, I used to set that as a course exercise. Mm -hmm. or uh, examination exercise. But yes, but here we're looking for what are the requirements of sketch of types. Functions are up to you. Um, sort of merging them sort of basically says we need both requirements and maybe something more. So it's something to think about in the break and then we break for 15 minutes. So kinetic energy, and we have uh, speed, well, it's listed there. But what are the functions we're having? So typically, we would have sort of the formula for energy would be speed times speed times uh, mass. Uh -huh. Times a half. Is it times a half for this? Times uh -huh. half weeks. Uh -huh. uh -huh. uh -huh. And if you make S to V, then it is uh, more than minus to be physics. And usually you say half mv squared. Half mv squared. Velocity. Mm -hmm. mv for velocity, sorry. Yeah, but then I have direction and everything. I was thinking You about. want to square. Well, it is a square. So typically these kind of things I code like v times v. There's some compilers that is faster ah, so in some languages. Okay. So the square function is. I don't know. Some compiler actually managed to figure that out. So instead of having it um, to force it to use the power function, you have to get the two point zero 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 one. Then it uses the power function. <laughs> Anyways, um... we have uh, we ha you have some momentum. P is mv. P is the momentum. Yeah. P equals mv. So we want to have p is equal to m, m. m times z, okay. And then you have also e equals p squared over m. p times p, p over 2m. Yeah. That is roughly how far I could come up with the relations I wanted. But mm. yeah. well, I was thinking if we were starting with this formula, we could have a multiplication operation, which was... We need to have our body first, that is at least what I figured out. So, um, and then I couldn't quite get... Uh, so you always had a sort of your T, your T. Mm -hmm. Then you had, uh, typically in, in the first instance, you had a real, and then we came up, oh, okay, it could also be an integer, or it could be a double, or have you what? So um, the, the first question I now have is, um, so V I would definitely put as a, as, a var as a variable, but M could be a parameter or a variable depending on context. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. that is how you would write the function to compute the energy. So basically you're saying that I could have a function energy uh, subscript mass, which would take uh, speed and return the energy. Yeah. Or I could have a function energy which takes two arguments and a v mm -hmm. and it returns the energy. Mm -hmm. Yes, I totally agree. Uh, what we don't, yes, if you do it like this, then you would have to have one such function for each energy. Unless it a bit, uh, for each mass you were Yes, showing my uh, my point of view, which is not in line with what you're trying to teach me today. I, I always come thinking out of the program. Mm -hmm. What am I going to simulate? Are all particles the same mass? 
Mm -hmm. I'll take your first line. Mm -hmm. if, if I have a bunch of particles. With different masses. With different masses. And so different kinds of particles. Mm -hmm. Then I would definitely go for the bottom. Mm -hmm. Yes. I perfectly see that. Mm -hmm. You know, you are having a more complex if you only are dealing with one sort of particles. Yeah. Like if you do electrons and only that, then you only need one. It's a fixed time. Or if you just have three kinds of particles, electrons and protons and neutrons, yeah. you kind of three functions and... Yeah. Uh, he's not yeah, happy with yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, no. So then you have to write three functions. Whereas here I only have to write one function. Mm -hmm. But you have to remember three numbers. But if you are dealing with, if, <laughs> if are dealing with small particles, they change and they change mass when the energy when the speed increases. No, then uh, then you are beyond that concept. Yeah. Then it is. So we assume big particles. So the, uh, mm -hmm. We assume macro particles, as you can see. With a normal uh, microscope. No, 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 it depends. Uh, so, uh, you assume okay, normal, okay, normal okay, speeds okay. and things which you can see in a microscope. I'm a chemist, so I tend to do the I... units that you can see. <laughs> but in chemistry, uh, you typically do quantum mechanics, which is sort of based on that. If you do quantum field, if you want to do the relativistic particles, you typically have to install the quantum fields. Yeah. What few chemists do actually relativistic? They are the quantum chemists. They do relativistic. Yeah. But luckily, we can do one version for each of your needs. <laughs> because this is not hit into the language. This is on the per need design. Uh, the trouble I'm coming into here was that if I decide to use multiplication functions, I could have a v, v to something. Or I could have this uh, m to v, or in this order, v m into something. Uh, so I need an intermediate type, and I need to be able to parse this according to whatever intermediate result I'm trying to build up. And that's sort of a problem we haven't thought about before, because before we would just have floats everywhere, and everything would just work with multiplication. If, if this is a multiplication operation, yeah. then if I have a type for the speed or velocity, and I have a type for mass, I need to have a multiplication operation which matches speed and speed, if I do this first, and then take that result with velocity. So I have some intermediate type 1, and then I have multiplication, intermediate type 1, and mass, and gives me energy. In this case, I have some intermediate type 2, and a multiplication, which takes uh, Vm, and then takes V, intermediate type 2, and gives me energy. You have, to, uh, you have that uh, on the very left-hand side in the second row. Essentially, what you're doing here is that... Is this one, one. yeah. But well, it, it, it doesn't matter if they are scalar, but if they are matrices, the sequence do matter. Mm -hmm. So no, no, no. Matrices you know, are still. put in anything else that's scalar here. No, matrix multiplication is associative, so that doesn't harm anything. But you want to have some axiom saying that this order of computation and this order of computation are related. And then we probably also need some scalar multiplication. So this is sort of energy one. And then we need to have multiplication with uh, real times energy one to give the proper energy so that we can scale thing by a half. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> this will be taken out of your honorarium. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but you're still on the same slide. <laughs> that doesn't count for five minutes later. <laughs> We've done all this discussion in the meantime. Ah, yeah. And that's the point of this exercise. 
So I think something new is cropping up about how to handle these intermediate types, which is a new experience because it's not just floats or matrices or some standard type with one multiplication operation. Uh, so I sort of given this as a problem to our DSL people to figure out what kind of parsing algorithm should we have to deal with these intermediate types. If we want to name them, otherwise there is some other ideas about keeping track of the dimensional units. But the downside of that is, of course, that we can't see the difference between momentum and torque, so or energy and torque. So we have a problem, whatever we do. But the solution to these problems are always domain specific. And the domain engineer, the person knowing the domain, will know what is a good solution in that domain. But you're sort of Yes, you have to think in a certain way that you didn't think before, and you need to work with that. But once you've done that a couple of times, it becomes easier, and you have a repertoire of reusable stuff for the other problems you see. Uh, so, has anybody thought about the solution to potential energy? You need some kind of field to operate in because if you're operating in free space, there is no gravity, so mm -hmm. or an electric field, there have to be some kind of field yeah. change yeah. that you have to work against in order to convert the energy. Mm -hmm. So again, it's sort of coming up with, okay, maybe the different fields require different concepts. Well, that's fine. You know what your problem is, you can describe it. If you're sort of a dam owner doing electricity, if you're a skater sort of going up and down a half pipe, that each domain has its sort of own vocabulary, its own needs, and you want to capture that and turn it into sort of the types of the requirements and the primitive operations you want from your requirement to make this thing tick. The benefits are this extra type safety, which you really cherish when your program gets long and difficult. And sometimes it will make your physics clearer or the solution to your mathematics clearer. But sometimes we are at odds with conventional notation because conventional notation has pre-processed lots of this into something which just uses numbers. And you also see that in other domains, we pre-process things down into things which just use complicated arrays rather than talking about the mathematics of the domain. So sort of untangling the mathematics and getting back to the real concepts involved and not just everything is a number where everything is a matrix or everything is a multidimensional array is sort of it's some work. It's not free. But then we are sort of getting closer to real physics rather than computerized physics. But real physics is the way we can approach things and then do the hard computations efficiently afterwards. templates and stuff like that is, is uh, error handling. Mm -hmm. When something goes wrong in, in your defined templates, in C++ stuff can be uh, interesting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> how, how do you work with that in, in Fortran? It's type safe. Yeah. You get a normal type error message. Yeah. Yeah. I actually think I've shown you a couple from... Yeah. But there you can do more than just type messages. So for instance, you can miss your half, like you just said. Yes. And uh, what would the debugger make from that? How do you figure out you lost a half? Hmm? How do you figure out you lost a half anywhere in your program? Uh, yeah, but uh, okay, I, I'm not sure whether I get on a tangent. 
Um, so um, it, normally, if I run a debugger, I can just step through the code. Yes. And um, if it's templated, it is you it's sort of not in the source file yet anymore. Mm -hmm. Would it create a subroutine for that effect, which I could step through or? Interesting question. Um, hopefully, I can answer that tomorrow afternoon. I'm still doing everything for tomorrow. Yeah, no, no, no. Uh, Not everything, but I'm, I'm, teach, I'm teaching myself. Sometimes I give my students the same answer. If you have... Pay attention tomorrow. Yeah, no, I said... I'm very happy with that. I do the same. Yeah. Uh, no, but I would say that if you want to use a debugger, classical debuggers for today, you would have to instantiate this and then look for the error. Uh, but you can also write unit tests, which should be able to capture these things easier. But sort of a scaling factor of a half, whether you commit that or not, you're going to be sort of quite precise in your unit tests to see that. And I probably would have made that mistake, and I would have made that in my unit tests, and I wouldn't see the problem until my energy was wrong. If I'm sort of going from kinetic energy to potential energy in the back, maybe my kinetic energy now is larger than when I started. So yes, um, we cannot get rid of all issues, but we can get rid of quite a lot of mental things. And also I think we can push more things into libraries which we can use, because now we're sort of going down to the primitive operations, what if we say that we have a kinetic library which does these computations for us, so we're not interested in the primitive multiplication, we're interested in the energy function which takes these inputs and gives me the energy. And if that is from a templated library that somebody else developed and tested quite a lot and hardened it for real use, then we probably are better off so we shouldn't always think about the low-level stuff. Maybe we should move upwards to the higher spheres of the problem we're trying to solve and then push all the difficulties into primitive libraries, which we can reuse. Mm -hmm.